Everyone, it's Ross, and in today's video, I thought I'd give you guys a nice little update on a few things. You know, the pomegranates, which is what we're looking at right now. These are the pomegranates that I've been growing now in containers for like four or five years, some of these trees. They're growing quite vigorously, but a lot of things in the yard have been a little bit of a disappointment. We're also going to update you guys on just a small fig update, and then we're going to talk about the sugar cane at the end of the video. Um, so stay tuned for that. I know a lot of you guys have been asking me. I think the short and sweet version of these pomegranates is that there's just been a lot happening with them. Every year it seems like something happens where they get kind of set back. And also I think they just take a bit longer to fruit. They take a bit longer to flower, especially compared to like the fig or something. You know, the fig, you can get fruit off of these really small trees in the first year. Um, whereas the pomegranate, man, these things are still a bit of a mystery. They don't also set fruit very well. Um, they did flower this year, actually quite heavily. And I was able to distinguish between the male and the female flowers and actually get them pollinated by hand because I feel like in the area here, they're not really supposed to be grown. And I have a feeling because you don't really find pomegranates here, you're not going to find the insects that probably pollinates these guys the best. Maybe there is an insect here that does it, but probably not that well, or maybe it's distracted by something else. You can see there's only really one female flower left on these trees out of, I would say close to a hundred uh, flowers in total. Um, so really disappointing that this is indeed the case, but it is what it is. Uh, you know, I'm not giving up. It's just that we're going to need to change up our techniques for, for next year. Um, definitely taking them out of the greenhouse and putting them underneath the sunroom for storage. And then that way they're going to wake up better. They're going to have a nice little transition that's much more smooth. Get them off to a better head start. And then that way, hopefully they can flower even more profu profusely than, last, than this year. And then maybe we can do some research, ask some friends, because this is not something new that I'm doing. You know, this isn't like I'm inventing the wheel here on this. This has already been done. People have been growing pomegranates in containers in colder climates that they're not really supposed to uh, for years now. You know, I have a couple friends that are doing this. So I'm going to talk to them and see what their challenges have been. I have a friend that's getting like 20, 25 pomegranates off one tree in a 20 gallon size pot, which is insane. So we're gonna have to talk to him and see what the deal is. One other thing I wanna mention to you guys is that in terms of the figs, this is my Aishia Black from a uh, French source. This is a uh, from a French conservatory over there, kind of like the USDA, how they preserve varieties in the United States, they preserve varieties in France. And Aishia Black is a variety that has been really riddled with fig mosaic virus. And you can see on this particular Aishia Black, that's what it's called actually, Aishia Black, that it looks almost FMV free. I mean, it really looks very quite healthy. It's much more vigorous and it's putting out quite a few fruits. I actually just took off about three of them to then let three of them potentially ripen at the end of the season. And we'll see if indeed this is the same thing. I don't entirely know for sure, but I thought I'd let you guys know that I'm on it, right? I'm trying to figure that out for myself. Additionally, some other things we're trying to figure out in terms of figs is that this is my golden rainbow. This is the one that Ben B really made um, quite popular through his videos. And um, I got it through my friend, Eric. Thank you, Eric. And he actually was able to contact the original owner of this tree. And then he, the owner, Robert, has actually been in the fig community quite recently talking about his fig and, and making more information available. What I've been able to discern from Ben's photos and Robert's photos, so far everybody's photos, and even now my fig itself, it really does look a lot like uh, yellow long neck or long yellow. And there's a big debate as to whether or not those two figs are the same. Um, you know, they have a similar name, obviously. They have that long neck. They're both yellow figs. They're large. They ripen early. They're very vigorous. You can see by the leaf pattern. This is what I would think is the, 
more typical leaf pattern on uh, long yellow or yellow long neck. And then sometimes they get like this five lobes here that you can see. Um, and this one actually looks very different than any other uh, leaf pattern that I've ever seen. So I don't know, we're gonna have to compare it and I wanna show you guys now I mean, at least for myself, this is really the first time in a while that I'm really looking at this um, on my own trees, but really compare the differences here. This is my yellow long neck, and you can see that leaf pattern looks pretty darn similar. Even the serrations here along the leaf, um, you know, they're not really that noticeable, but maybe on this leaf here, usually I've seen them a single lobe or three lobes and then they have the five lobe, you know, the heart shape here. Plus you've got some that have the long neck. They're a bigger fig. Same thing, yellow, similar taste profile. I would be shocked. I mean, even just looking at this now, this is, uh, look at that leaf. That looks almost exact to what we were just looking at. So, and here's a five lobe right here, or pretty close to it. And the differences in the leaves are really not going to tell us a whole lot because, or even the leaves themselves, because the leaves will change on vigor and it's not really the best indication of a variety. It really is not something that you should be paying attention to. In fact, the leading indicator of discerning one variety of fig from the other is the shape of the fig. And without a doubt, the shape is almost exact. Um, you know, also the, the length of the stem here, the length of the neck, the shape of the actual fig itself. I, I mean, how can you really argue with that? And finally, Robert came to the community and put some information out and I asked him, you know, because it's called golden rainbow, right? It changes colors apparently. And that's why they named it, I think in part, I think uh, after a rainbow because it changes colors and I asked him if it's normally changing colors all season or if that's just at the end of the season which I had suspected suspected that's just normally what happens in colder climates specifically the Pacific Northwest by the way that these figs just change colors they're very strange a fig that ripens in Europe let's say in England a really cool rainy climate um, or also the Pacific Northwest, you guys just have very different looking figs than the rest of the places you can grow figs. I mean, it's just a fact. So that whole color thing that everybody keeps getting hung up on is really just not something we should even be worrying about because that's just something that happens in their climate. Um, I also wanted to talk about my Black Madeira KK. Extremely healthy tree quite vigorous it's just taken over this was like a, a 20 25 gallon something like that I think that we just planted in the ground this year you can see how many figs it's got on it it's kind of nuts in terms of the density of figs on here and believe it or not my black Madeira UC Davis has more figs than my black Madeira KK this year and it's only in a 10 gallon size pot um, so quite strange, but we did prune this tree very heavily and I think that's probably why. But you can see how many suckers are coming up from the base. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of cuttings. What I'm gonna do is actually air layer this off the entire trunk because it's so big. I mean, look how thick this trunk is. If I wanted to chop this down for cuttings, no one's gonna buy that. So we're gonna put on as many air layers as I can and then kind of chop down the rest because inevitably the top of this tree anyway is going to die back and what's going to be left over is the suckers we're going to leave the suckers and then cover this whole area with a tarp but uh, what's interesting about this tree is that it's showing five lobes and people have said oh you know black madeira never shows five lobe leaves it's either one lobed or three lobes otherwise it's not right well you guys Whoever said that doesn't know what they're talking about because that is a black Madeira right there <laughs> with five lobes. And that's exactly why we don't really want to pay attention too much to the leaf pattern because they will change dramatically based on the vigor and the nutrients available. 
If you were to compare, as an example, my in-ground figs, the leaf pattern on these, to a, the same variety grown in a pot on the patio, the leaf patterns would be probably dramatically different. And now obviously that depends on the, um, the variety, but there's like a little bit of proof there for you guys. Evidence, you know, this is not nonsense, but most people who do talk about figs are pretty much talking nonsense, if you ask me, including myself. A lot of times we're just wrong. And, uh, you know, sometimes it can be speculation. Other times uh, we could be dead on, but how much do we really know about figs? I don't know. So I just wanted to leave you guys with that. But the last thing here is the sugar cane. And I was told by my buddy Brian, Brian, if you're watching, I think you said that this is indeed sugar cane, but it doesn't look like it to me. But however, <laughs> this is where I planted it. But I don't see on the stem here. I mean, the leaves look okay. The leaves look right to me. And I can't imagine this being a weed. But I'm very confused. Why is the stem doesn't have like, kind of like the bamboo lookingness to it? You know what I mean? Like, why doesn't this look like bamboo? It kind of looks like a, like a grass in my yard that just came up. You know, it's also sending off offshoots here quite a few at the base. This is the only one that came up out of all the uh, sugar cane I planted here in this, this location. It's right behind the, the artichokes. Um, so I don't know if you can tell me that this is or isn't, I kind of wonder myself. Um, I'm tempted to just chop this open and see for myself, but I really want to let it grow. I don't want to disturb this because this is indeed the only one I have. Uh, what we'll do for sure is let this whole thing grow and then we'll chop it down in the fall, harvest it then, but then cover the base with something. And I think what my plan is now for the future in this section of the yard is that we're going to move this particular vegetable bed here. We're going to put everything in here from now on uh, because I think the trees that are just behind here all these figs are just in a sh two of a shady spot including the pomegranate the salavatsky that i said i would show you guys at the end it just doesn't get enough light back in here and as a result i can't even show i can't even really get to it but as a result it's growing but you know who knows how well it's actually going to do this winter time um, so these just giant tomato plants that are 10 feet tall Legitimately, that's how tall they are, um, are just shading everything out. And if I had instead maybe, uh, I don't know, the way this is all organized doesn't make a whole lot of sense in terms of the height of these different things, but that's just what I, I ended up having to deal with. So maybe we can move this somewhere. Um, I, sh I think if I move this out of here, we can put more figs in here, which I think would make... Um, a lot more sense but then again whatever we put behind this bed is then going to get shaded out once again because all these figs then are going to get shaded out so i don't know what i'm going to do but it's a thought something in my mind that we don't have to decide on just yet but it is what it is oh you know what this is something that really doesn't get a whole lot of attention in my videos this is fennel and i love fennel and I, this is only the, this is the bronze variety here, which is also edible. You can see it's flowering now. And what I'm gonna do, it's actually really the, the, um, the bees, and it seems like the parasitic wasps and also really small type beneficial insects. I don't know exactly what they're called, but there's different types of wasps that I've seen throughout the yard. They love this thing. And what I'm going to do, I love this particular crop for many reasons. You can take off these leaves and then actually add them, chop them up like chives really thinly and add them to your foods, so your Italian cooking, and it really adds that nice fennel flavor to it. Um, the bronze fennel though, however, doesn't bulb up really all that well. So that's a big loss right there. But what I'm going to do is get some actual fennel and then that way we can have 
you know, bulbing fennel and that's, it's kind of like an onion in that way, in that it bulbs, you cut it up like an onion, use it like an onion, but it has a different flavor. Additionally, what I'm gonna do is that once these things get pollinated and they set seeds, I'm gonna save all the seeds. And the seeds really can be quite awesome in the kitchen. Fennel seed's awesome. Um, so, I don't know, that's just a nice little showcase. It's a beautiful plant, by the way. Not only is it beautiful, it attracts these nice insects. Um, so, yeah, I have seen very little pest pressure in the yard this year, by the way, guys. Really just some aphids on the tomatoes. Um, we have some cucumber beetles. Other than that, there's like nothing. Um, I've had a couple, a little bit on the, uh, the apples here. I can't remember the name of that pest. Um, it's not coming to me, but it, it really destroys the apples and they, they fall prematurely. Uh, oh, codling moth. So that's that exists. I haven't seen very much at all of the SWD this year. There's been very little Japanese beetle damage. You can see that on the grapes. It's very little. I'm just blown away um, that that's the case. So I don't know, man, the yard is like, it's coming together. You know, everything is really adapting and doing well and we're attracting the right, the right insects that are keeping out the wrong ones. And uh, everything's looking great. So that's a little bit of an update there. I hope that wasn't too long for you guys. I hope that was definitely something you guys wanted to see. Uh, if you guys want me to update you on something in particular, let me know down in the comments. We'll get to it at some point for sure uh, but it's just such a beautiful in this this little area here it's just so gorgeous and i know we really tried hard to make this look beautiful and i think it came out really nice you know there's things like lavender nasturtiums i even have some german chamomile that actually got chopped chopped down a little bit we have different types of sedum one down here a larger one over here you've got the bee balm you've got the fennel you've got these i think these are echinaceas this thing i have no idea what this is we have borage which puts out these nice blue flowers although i think the borage and correct me if, if anyone has the same issue let me know and that the borage gets to a certain height and then it falls over and it breaks and it just looks like hell um, also look there's a cucumber beetle on that so that's not good. Maybe this is attracting the cucumber beetle as well. I'll have to look into that. But uh, that cucumber beetle is like the bane of my existence sometimes. All right, guys. Thank you all for watching. We'll catch you all for tomorrow's video. I think we're going to talk about edamame. All right, guys. Take care.